Thanks. So good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this uh, new colloquium here at the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Aris Caras Tergiu from the University of Oxford. And he will talk about pulsar astrophysics in the era of uh, large surveys. So today is May the 4th with you, Aris. <laughs> Isabel, please. The okay. So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for attending this uh, new uh, Severo Ochoa web locking this time. We don't have the pleasure to have the, the, the speaker in person, but it's a pleasure to have, to have him online. Thank you very much, uh, Aris, for having accepted in our, our invitation. Uh, Dr. Aris Karastegiu is an associate professor and senior research fellow at St. Edmund Hall in uh, the Department of Physics in the University of, of Oxford since uh, 2007. He graduated from the University of Bonn in 2002 uh, with his PhD research conducted at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. He got then postdocs at the University of Sydney and uh, also as a Marie Curie Fellow at uh, IRAM in Grenoble after uh, and before going to Oxford where he teaches special and general relativity at uh, Forest and Edmund Hall. Dr. Karastadiu is also an, a square kilometer array visiting professor at Rhodes University in South Africa. His main research uh, interests involved understanding the pulsar population and astrophysical uh, problems related to pulsars. He works on observational and computational techniques to achieve pulsar science goals with next generation telescopes, such as, for instance, the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, SKAO. In preparation for these, Iris uses uh, data from uh, telescopes such as Meerkat and LOFA and uh, co-leads the Thousand Pulsar Array project on Mercat. He is the PI of the group developing the pulsar and fast transient search component of the SKIO, and is a co-chair of the SKIO Pulsar Science Working Group. And as René told us today, he's talking about pulsar astrophysics in the area of large service. So thanks again, uh, Aris, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Isabel. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to give this talk. Um, I'll try to describe some key goals and key difficulties in pulsar astrophysics in this talk, and I'll intentionally describe some phenomenology that you may not often hear uh, about in, in talks that address pulsar timing and pulsar searches. And this is done on purpose to sort of give you a, another angle about um, why we're interested in studying pulsars the way we do. And I've tried to put together an informative talk with some sort of coherent narrative, but there are many aspects of, of this that are, I am not going to be covering today, which are, of course, equally interesting and sometimes quite enigmatic. And maybe we'll leave those for the next for the next opportunity. So, um, well, from my point of view, we are conducting pulsar surveys. Uh, to understand the population of neutron stars primarily, and then to use neutron stars as, as physical tools in experiments where, um, <clears throat> where they have a very special role to play. So what are the questions that we, we want to understand in terms of understanding the population? Well, we want to understand some very basic things, uh, despite the fact that almost 60 years have gone by since the discovery of, of pulsars, we don't know how many there are, how many neutron stars there are in the galaxy and how many of those are radio pulsars and how many we should expect to see from those. And if we understood that, do those numbers agree with the predicted numbers and rates from various formation channels of stellar evolution? Once we have an understanding of this population, do we expect that different subgroups in this population evolve into each other, or should we uh, understand this population as different, different subgroups um, originating from, from different progenitors or in, in, through different mechanisms? Um, radio emission in pulsars comes from the magnetosphere around the pulsar, so 
um, we still don't understand what exactly the, the radio emission process is. Um, and that clearly is an issue because it's one of the main carriers of information to, to learn all of this stuff that I'm going to talk about today. We want to understand neutron star interiors and how they interact with the magnetosphere. And the reason I'm phrasing this, this question in this way, you may have heard before that people are interested in neutron star interiors, but my interest is more about how the interior interacts with the magnetosphere in the sense that all the information that we're getting from radio pulses comes from the magnetosphere and we're trying to learn about the interior. So we need to understand that connection as well, um, better than we do today. Um, do we understand the magnetic fields of neutron stars? Um, I would say we, we do to zeroth order or to first order, but uh, is that sufficient to, um, to be able to say that we understand neutron stars completely and to use them for the, for the very careful experiments that we want to, to, to use them as tools for? And also, what are the actual limitations uh, of using radio, radio observations for exploiting, or exploiting pulses? It's good to understand what we can and what we cannot do. Um, the, the pictures I've put on the left of this slide, I'll, I'll, I'll come to during the talk. So um, the, the second reason we're um, conducting surveys for finding pulsars or studying pulsars is to, to improve the use of pulsars as tools for other experiments. So for example, you don't necessarily need to know everything about how pulsars work in order to conduct high precision pulsar timing experiment and to experiments and to address questions in fundamental physics. And that you do by finding relativistic binaries or pulsar black hole binaries, triple systems um, that I'll talk about later in this talk. But there you can just assume that a pulsar or a given pulsar is, is just a clock and you don't care about what it's made of or how it, uh, how it functions. Um, you can use these sorts of pulsar timing experiments to work out neutron star masses from radio observation. Um, and you can use, again, with respect to interiors, you can use pulsars as labs to understand the equation of state of dense cold nuclear matter. So the, the, equa the, the state of matter in the interiors of neutron stars is not accessible to us, to us in, in, a, in a lab. Um, so the pulsars are the only um, domain in the universe that we have to, to probe um, dense cold nuclear matter. We can use pulsars as gravitational wave detectors, and in some cases, pulsars as gravitational wave emitters as well. And this, this field is definitely gathering, gathering pace um, and has been over the last few years. Uh, and we can use pulsars to understand the magnetic fields um, in, our, in our galaxy at multiple scales using Faraday rotation measurements and so on. And there's lots of other interesting experiments that mainly come from the, the, the key uh, property of, of pulsars that they are very small, so they are kind of uh, ideal point sources, and they have these, uh, these, these extreme um, um, ro rotational properties, extreme rotational stability and so on. So I think it's important to understand, and um, especially for, for people who don't think about pulsars every day, like I do, what the actual observables are and which, which parameters are observed and which parameters are derived and which parameters are model dependent. I think that's a crucial, crucial um, thing to think about. And so, so this slide addresses, addresses the, this point. And so um, on, the, on the left here, I hope you can see uh, the little red pointer there. On the left here is a typical um, figure of the pulse profile of a radio pulsar. This one's called J0738 minus 4042. And what you see here is total intensity in black versus rotational phase. So the neutron star is rotating around its rotation axis. There's a radio beam the beam is sweeping past the telescope. This is the phase of rotation on the x-axis, and this is the intensity. Uh, so what we observe, the observable, is the pulse profile, actually in full polarization. So you see in red here is the linearly polarized component, and in blue, the circularly polarized component. Uh, this 
panel above shows the angle of the polarization of the linearly polarized component, which you see is measured very well because the linear polarization is, is very strong. Um, what else do we observe? We observe um, our, our instruments are typically broad bands. So we observe this profile across a broad bandwidth. So um, this is, um, if I'm not mistaken, the bandwidth of the um, 21 centimeter receiver Meerkat. And so you see the pulse profile uh, at the um, highest part of the band and the pro pulse profile at the lowest part of the band. This is just total power um, enco encoded in some, some color scheme. And we can also observe individual pulses. So this is a stack of individual pulses versus time versus rotational phase. And you can see the variability in the individual pulses from this source, which is typical of pulsar. So you can measure, what you can measure is um, the, the periodicity of the pulsar plus the periodicities and modulation times in the single pulses. So in terms of observables, the period of rotation is something that you can directly measure. The derivatives, the first derivative is the, is the the most important one, but also the second, as I'm going to, I'm going to talk about later. So the, 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 the temporal derivatives of the rotational period are directly uh, observable things. Um, you can also make an image. In fact, with most modern telescopes, you have uh, an imaging capability that, that exists at the same time as measuring things in the time domain. So the image gives you environmental um, um, data, so th things to do with the environment of the pulsar. Uh, and from these parameters, you can also derive, to some extent, the um, interstellar dispersion, so the, the, the dispersion ca caused at radio frequencies due to the free electron content in our galaxy. Um, scattering and scintillation, which are, uh, again, ISM-related phenomena that stem from anisotropic distributions of free electrons in the galaxy, uh, absorption by um, um, clouds uh, of gas in, in the, in the, uh, on the line of sight. And then you can also derive from these measurements accurate uh, estimates of the position, proper motion, and to some extent, the distance of the pulsar. And the reason I'm saying you derive the position and the proper motion is because these are, are, are they, they, these fall out of the timing modeling. So if you have um, assumed that a pulsar is at a particular location and it's actually, there's an error in that position that appears as a residual in the, uh, in the pulsar timing. So these are, these, this is a synopsis of all the observable quantities. Um, in the in the radio, pulsars are extremely variable. They are they are generators of fascinating data sets, um, and time time series, I should say. There's variability on all time scales and a complexity of phenomena that that are both organized and um, and stochastic to some extent. So this is this is a plot that I really like from a paper by Tim Hankins in 2003 that shows um, data from a purpose-built instrument um, that could record at extremely fast rate. So you see the axis here is microseconds, and these are microbursts, let's say, radio microbursts from the crab pulsar, which if you look on the, on the uh, y-axis here, you see have a, a flux density that exceeds uh, Mega Jansky. Um, for those of you who are not thinking about radio astronomy <laughs> uh, all the time, uh, a Jansky is 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 the typical sort of radio astronomy unit, right? It's ten to the minus twenty six watts per square meter per hertz. Uh, so it's a very very small amount of 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 power, but um, but pulsars are typically micro Janskys to Janskys in their own flux density. So these these observations that show the pulsar emission on the shortest time scale is extremely bursty and extremely bright are quite revealing about the, uh, the pulsar mechanism. So there's other ways to uh, interrogate the emission mechanism. Um, for example, 
the variability, the pulse to pulse variability, what, what does it mean in terms of the distribution of energy uh, per pulse? So this, this plot here shows six um, histograms of the, um, the pulse energy um, for, for, six, for six different sources. And the interesting thing here is that the, the shape of this histogram is not always the same. So the, emis the emission mechanism can generate um, uh, distributions of pulse energies that look like power laws, such as uh, 0540 plus 23 and 0823 plus 26, but also Gaussian or log normal cases such as the others plotted here. And for 0540, just going one step further, um, this is a plot from um, data from Meerkat where um, we've, we've looked at um, th this pulsar specifically, it's in the, it's in the large Magellanic cloud. Um, this pulsar is an emitter of giant pulses. Uh, giant pulses have had, what I mean by giant pulses is, um, is that, 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 that frequently this pulsar emits radio pulses that are much, much brighter than the mean radio pulse. Historically, this term has been used to describe pulsars that have pulses that are 10 times brighter than the mean. But in fact, the, the more physically meaningful definition, I think, is that there are pulsars with a power law spectrum of flux, um, where there are pulses that are 10, 100, or even 1,000 times brighter than the average pulse. And so this is just to show you some sort of typical phenomenology that you that you see across the population. On the short on the shorter timescales, but not the extremely short, uh, on the pulse to pulse, let's say timescales, um, these observations capture the time dependence of the emission process um, on the on the timescale of the rotational period. And the variability you see here, which includes long nulls, but also, um, changes from one state to another, and in some cases, organized drifting of, of components. This is probably capturing the dynamic mechanisms in the, in the pulsar magnetosphere where the particles responsible for the radio emission, um, uh, the, the, the timescales that they are being regenerated in the, in the pulsar magnetosphere are, uh, are are of order the timescales that you see in the variability here. Then when you go to much longer timescales, and this, this is relatively new, this, this, this is sort of an emerging field over the last decade, um, pulsars show significant variability on timescales of months, years, and even decades. And what this plot shows is the, the shape of the pulse profile in blue in the top row here, compared to a constant, let's say, template in magenta, uh, where you see that at, um, at this interval D, which corresponds to this, this line here on the, on the timeline at the bottom, the pulsar grew a new component, which you can see in the, in the residual between the observation and the template, and this component has persisted until today. In fact, um, we, we're producing a, a paper on this pulsar with data that, that goes all the way back to almost 1972 or 1970 when, when this was first discovered. What's the, what's the key point here? Pulsar timing that you hear about quite often um, relies on uh, being able to cross-correlate a, a, a template of the pulse profile with the observed pulse profile. And the um, accuracy of measuring the TOA and the precision of the, of the time of arrival depends on the pulse shape emitted by the pulsar being as constant as possible or as close as possible to the template. If you start having changes in the, in the pulse profile, that are not matched by the template that you're trying to time it with, this introduces an error. <clears throat> and it has become apparent that these errors exist in the data and we need to start understanding where they come from. Okay, so when, when people talk about the population of pulsars, they also 
always referred to something called the PP dot diagram. So this is the diagram that places pulsars um, in different positions depending on their period and their um, first temporal derivative of the period. This is what this looked like in 1988, which I think was the year that I first heard about pulsars in my life. And it was due to an episode of, Car of Carl Sagan's Cosmos, and he was interviewing Jocelyn Bell or some, 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 something of that sort. In 1988, there were a few hundred pulsars known, and they all had um, pulse periods above 100 milliseconds or so, apart from a very small number of um, millisecond pulsars down here. And one of the objectives of pulsar surveys, pulsar searches, let's say, with current telescopes and with the SKA is to fill out this space. So between 1988 and 2015, for example, the PP dot diagram changed significantly. And uh, it has revealed a whole bunch of interesting subpopulations, as, for example, the young high E dot and gamma ray emitting pulsars um, at the top left corner up here with periods typically of sub 100 millisecond uh, and uh, relatively large um, p dots, large temporal derivatives. Then there's the bulk population of normal pulsars, which some people consider to be boring, but at the same time, there's so many of them that, that uh, uh, you're always bound to find interesting corner case examples in there. And for that reason, I find them particularly interesting, I have to say. Um, there's the group of neutron star and neutron star binaries. Um, and in this group, we know of a single pulsar pulsar binary. So a neutron star and neutron star binary where, where we observe bo both sources as a pulsar uh, was detected about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, sorry, and the um, population of millisecond pulsars, which are recycled. So the pulsars that have been recycled by accretion from a companion, and they also have high E dot, so high uh, rotational kinetic energy um, derivative. And they're also gamma ray emitters. So that's quite interesting. The, the red points here and the red points here are gamma ray emitters. And it's, uh, it's worth noting this because I'm going to talk about that. Uh, in a bit. There's, a, there's another little population up in the top right corner there, which are the um, inferred high magnetic field pulsars. And I'll, I'll talk to you about how that inference is made. And these are the pulsars that were formerly known as anomalous X-ray pulsars or soft gamma repeaters. <clears throat> so do the pulsars in the um, in the PP dot diagram, are they different populations that are that originate through different channels and different mechanisms, or do they evolve into each other? This is a very important question because we have to understand what the birth rates are, especially if you know there's a relatively solid connection between neutron stars and core collapse supernovae, and we think we understand the rate of those in our galaxy. So. Can we um, do the numbers agree in terms of the um, the observed neutron star population and the and the supernova? <clears throat> so there's a bunch of uh, model dependent parameters that are also very very um, important in in pulsar astrophysics, and I've I've I highlighted them in 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 the red box here, and. Um, they, they refer basically to the textbook um, canonical pulsar, which I've uh, shown in the plot on the left. So the canonical pulsar is a little neutron star with a dipolar magnetic field, and the um, misaligned magnetic axis to the rotation axis gives rise to a force that pulls out charged particles from the surface of the neutron star. And these charged particles are accelerated in the magnetosphere because the field lines of the magnetic field extend beyond the so-called light cylinder. In other words, the, the radius of a cylinder where the co-rotation velocity becomes equal and greater to the speed of light. So these field lines can't close effectively, so they, they, are, um, they can accelerate. Um, part particles can keep moving along these field lines, and particles are, are accelerated. 
So the, the textbook description of the radio emission process says that some sort of seed particles from the surface or some, some more radical ideas include cosmic rays and so on. They're accelerated by a potential above the polar cap that's formed due to the misaligned axes. And this leads to radiation, um, which is in gamma rays initially, these photons an annihilate and they produce electron positron pairs, which are the secondary particles that are accelerated along the field lines and generate the radio emission. So assuming all of that, then you can infer the surface magnetic field of the pulsar. And the assumption from an observational point of view here is that the derivative of the period that you measure is entirely due to the fact that you have a gigantic spinning strong dipole magnet okay so under that assumption you can actually say the magnetic field is this so in in this equation you'll see there's the radius of the star there's the inclination angle between the magnetic axis and the and the um and the rotation axis and there's also i which is the the moment of inertia um the moment of inertia is typically assumed to be something like 10 to the 45 uh grams centimeter squared and that's what you would get if you assume 1.4 solar masses and a radius of 10 kilometers so that that's kind of that will be ballpark correct for for, for all neutron stars um the other the other inferred parameter is something called the characteristic age which is nothing other than the period derived by divided by two times the period derivative the assumption there is that all pulsars are born uh, with a very very fast rotating period and over time the period gets longer and longer because um, they are uh, slowing down due to the um the, the the breaking because of the fact that they are a gigantic magnetic dipole that's uh, that's misaligned so apart from those two two parameters there's also e dot so e dot is um just the rotational kinetic energy um that's being um that, that's being lost by the fact that the pulsar is slowing down so irrespective of what is slowing the pulsar down you can still measure or derive E dot by this combination of P and P dot. And you see the moment of inertia is in here as well. And it helps to try and parameterize the, um, the rotational frequency derivative in this way in order to construct a parameter called the breaking index N, which is the spin frequency times the second derivative of the spin, spin frequency over the first derivative squared. And I'll tell you about why this is an important quantity in a bit. And so um, there are, interestingly and worth mentioning, there are pulsars that are being discovered uh, that have very slow periods now. These are, there's an observational bias um, against finding these sources with, with surveys. So it's it's kind of hard to do for various reasons, but there are now pulsars that are um, quite a bit slower than the bulk of the of the population here, as you can see, ranging uh, up to a few seconds uh, above ten seconds. There's a pulsar now with a seventy six second period, and there's an, another radio source that uh, that uh, has a period of eighteen minutes, although it's um, slightly still still slightly unclear about whether that's a neutron star or a white dwarf of some sort anyway um the the point is that when you <clears throat> despite the derived parameters that i highlighted in the red box uh, when you see pb dot diagrams in in pulsar related papers they commonly come with these sets of diagonal lines so you see diagonal lines that that have constant characteristic age on them and diagonal lines that have constant magnetic field or surface magnetic field strength um so the, the field strength going through the main bulk of the pulsars is about 10 to the 12 gauss the inferred surface magnetic field and the um the uh, characteristic ages go from a killer year here to 100 kilo years to 10 mega years and so on so um 
th these these things are plotted typically in PV dot diagrams, despite the fact that there's a whole bunch of assumptions that that, that uh, need to be um, justified in order to do this. Um, one way or another, puzzles are going to be evolving on the PV dot diagram, and if you just consider the fact that um, that those those intervals in characteristic age are on log on a logarithmic scale, the the this part of the PP dot diagram will always correspond to the oldest, you know, the the the, popul the population of puzzles that have been around for the longest period of time. And for that reason alone, you would expect that that's where the majority of pulsars sit. So in other words, there's you know there's there's ten million years of interval between here and here, whereas there's only about a thousand years somewhere here. So so um, it's not possible in a in a plot like this now that we have three thousand odd pulsars to show what the density uh, of sources is at any given area of the PP dot diagram, but uh, but I think it's worth from now on plotting PP dot diagrams um, using density plots so you can see actually where the majority of the sources lie. And they don't actually, there's no pile up of old sources here. Um, it seems that the, the, the peak of the population lies actually in the, in the middle of the distribution. And you can see the millisecond pulsars in the corner here. And so, um, so it, it's my. Um, own view that these lines of constant magnetic field strength that go like um, this, this line here, and this line here, and this line here, and the lines of uh, characteristic age, um, which uh, are these lines here, this one, this one, this one, are not, oh, sorry, this one, this one, this one, um, are not as, um, well, they need to come along with, with their caveats and their assumptions, whereas the lines of constant E dot, which are the, the, the tilted ones, the red ones here, um, are less, uh, require less justification, and they also explain some, some nice properties and some nice um, classifications of the, of the population. So let's talk about the emission itself. Okay, so radio emission is coherent. Um, it's it, the if you take a bunch of pulsars and you measure their spectra, the typical thing an astrophysicist would do, you find that their spectra are steep negative in the radio. They have a peak that's somewhere around minus 1.4, minus 1.5. It has been reported in the past. In our most recent paper with our with uh, data from the Meerkat radio telescope, we find that the the mean actually is somewhere around minus 1.7 or 1.8. But you see there's an extremely broad distribution of the spectral index. And most pulse, most pulse spectra you can fit with a, a power law of some sort, that's good. But there are frequency dependent effects that are, that are probably related both to the emission mechanism of the pulsar and to the interstellar medium that intervenes that prevent you from, um, uh, well, that, that, that broaden this distribution, let's say. And there's another effect as well, which is that broadband um, instruments, um, broadband radio telescopes, have a very different beam size at the top and bottom uh, end of the band. And so positional um, uncertainties of the source itself might lead to further steepening of the of the measured um, spectral index. One way or another, they are relatively steep negative um, spectral index objects, but not always easy to distinguish from, from AGN just from their spectrum alone. Um, so the radio emission process is coherent, and we understand that because we can Tribute some sort of brightness temperature to to it, and it turns out to be above ten to the twenty Kelvin. So this is this is a typical plot that uh, that exists in the pulse, pulsars and transients community to show this sort of thing. So on the y-axis you have radial luminosity um, measured as the flux density times the distance squared, and on the x-axis you have a quantity that describes the the temporal duration times the bandwidth. And um, the 
this kind of um, plotting things in this way means that um, effective temperature, um, constant effective temperature lines are can be plotted uh, as diagonal lines on this plot. So you see, this is where pulsars lie. This is where fast radio bursts lie, assuming um, you you um, you use the the distances that are inferred and um, some some other extraordinary objects are above above this uh, this cutoff. So let's talk a little bit of, uh, more about uh, e dot then. So e dot is just the um, temporal derivative of the uh, rotational kinetic energy, and it turns out to to you can you can derive it if you measure p and p dot, and it is it's given by this equation here. And the luminosity that we observe, as I said, is just uh, we, we just usually um, measure it as the as the flux density times the distance squared. So if you take the observed luminosity of pulsars and you try and parameterize it as a function of p to some um, exponent small p and p dot to some exponent small q, um, which which of the um, derived physical properties of the pulsar does the luminosity relate to is the question. And so with the latest meerkat data, for example, we are, we are able to do that. In the background here, the colors represent something called the Spearman p-value. Okay, so this is just the darker colors show you the values for, of A and B, which are the exponents of p and p dot, for which um, the uh, luminosity um, matches best the observed population luminosity. And you see basically that, uh, so, so I've got three lines plotted on here. The red line is the line that corresponds to the luminosity being some function of E dot. The blue line, the luminosity would be some function of characteristic age and the and the dark blue line would be that the luminosity is some function of the surface magnetic field. And you see, in fact, that the uh, the the the, the p-value, the the uh, the Spearman analysis shows you that it's much more likely that the radio luminosity is correlated to E dot. So E dot is the um, is the is the is the physical property that the radio luminosity correlates to, and that's not surprising because E dot tells you what the reservoir of energy is and some of that turns into radio. Um, so I'm going to talk to you briefly about the polarization geometry in B field. So pulsars are highly polarized and the polarization means that you can say something about the geometry. Uh, so as the pulsar beam sweeps past the telescope, you see that the polarization angle executes a very smooth curve. And this is what you would expect to see if you're looking at the projected magnetic field lines from a, from a gigantic dipole. And there's a very simple equation that describes that, where alpha is the inclination angle, and zeta is the inclination angle plus the impact parameter. That's the shortest distance of the line of sight to the magnetic pole. And so I just want to show you some examples of what pulsars look like. Some, some pulsars are extremely highly polarized, almost 100% polarized but then again, not at every rotational phase. Um, some pulsars show very complex profiles and only say a, a part of that expected S-shaped curve. So why is that? Some pulsars have very low degrees of, relatively low degrees of linear polarization, but possibly some circular polarization and a distorted, you know, wiggly position angle profile. And this is an inter, a, a, a case where the, the polarization is, is medium high and the profile is also quite distorted and you see very high degrees of circular polarization. So pulsars are uh, sort of unique emitters of circular polarization. So why do we see such a, a variety of states? I mean, is there a way to reduce this complex parameter space, reduce the degrees of freedom? There's lots of questions here and some potential answers, but I just I just wanted to highlight these things for you. Can we can we 
um, generate an emission process or can we uh, envisage an emission process that generates all sorts of degrees of polarization, including circular polarization, including organized position angle swings and disorganized position angle swings. And there are some key observables here, like orthogonal jumps in the position angle, the degree of circular polarization, the frequency dependence, and the E dot dependence. And of course, all of these things you can, with modern telescopes, interrogate as a function of frequency. So the parameters that you associate with geometry, in principle, they shouldn't be related. They sh there shouldn't be a frequency dependence. Um, so observing a frequency dependence, as you see here, so these waterfall plots, the you know the axis here is always frequency, and they're showing you um, the the total power and uh, circular polarization as, as well as the position angle. Um, the fact that there is a frequency dependence tells you that there is a non-geometrical component to the polarization, which if your aim is to understand the geometry, then you need to understand this. And if your aim is to understand how many pulsars there are, then you need to understand the geometry because you need to understand how many of them are beaming towards you. So all of these things are always interconnected. I'll, I'll skip over this. The, um, the, the other simple observable quantities are um, the width of, of the pulse profile, so the, the, the width of the actual pulse. And under certain assumptions, you would expect the width to be a function of the pulse period. If the emission height above the star is constant, then the width you would expect to be proportional to the period to the minus one half. And depending on how you do your analysis, you might, you might say that's the case. But in fact, um, the published results show uh, a dependence on p as p to the minus 0.3. So that means that the emission height is not constant, more like, most likely, uh, as the pulsar evolves. And other things that we know about the population is that the degree of linear polarization is the highest for pulsars with the highest E dot. So the highest E dot pulsars are the youngest pulsars in the top left-hand corner of the PP dot diagram. And as the E dot value decreases, then the linear polarization also decreases. So again, coming back to those equations, you know, what, what can we say about the strength of the magnetic field as pulsars age? Well, it's getting to the point now where we've observed a few pulsars for, for you know, over 40 years. And the, the breaking index that I mentioned earlier is a, is a diagnostic as to whether the primary mechanism for spinning down pulsars is magnetic dipole breaking. So um, for, the, for the crab pulsar, um, we can see that the breaking index um, over time has uh, wobbled up and down with a, with a significant departure here, but somewhere around 2.5, 2.5 something. And if, the, if magnetic dipole breaking is the only, you know, is the dominant mechanism for spinning down, then this value of the breaking index should be three. So for the best pulsar we have, we know that this value isn't three. And there was a paper by Marcus Lower et al. in 2021 that published breaking indices for, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 pulsars, I don't know how many they are, that showed that there's a, there's a significant number of pulsars where the breaking index can be measured not to be three. So that casts some doubt or some further doubt to the value of these surface magnetic field measurements and characteristic age measurements. Um, I should also say that some pulsars um, seem to have glitches, so that the glitches are sudden spin-ups of the pulsar that are followed by a recovery to the original um, period or thereabouts. And if you account for, for these, uh, these spin-ups, then over a long period of time, they also seem to be spinning down with a, a, a breaking index of somewhere around three. So in other words, the short-term um, spin or spin down properties of pulsars may be determined by something to do with the uh, intrinsic properties or the coupling of the um, 
superfluids in the interiors of neutron stars to the crust, but over long periods of time, pulsars may be spinning down um, according to magnetic dipole radiation predictions. Um, I, I, I think I should um, speed up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a couple of these things and just, um, just talk a little bit about um, the connections between the radio beam and the pulsar spin down. So I've, I've spoken a little bit about the changes in the pulse shape. Um, and one of the key developments there, which I'll show in this plot here, um, over the last decade was not only that the pulse shape changes, but the, the, the pulse shape sometimes correlates with dramatic timing events. So you see when this pulse component appeared in, in this pulsar in 2005, the first derivative of the pulsar spin also changed by 15% um, over a period of, of uh, 100 days or so. And in fact, it showed a very dramatic changing profile for um, three years before it stabilized at a, at a value that's 15% uh, different to what it was before. Um, this coincided with a change in the, in, the, in the pulse profile. But the interesting thing here is that if you relate these numbers to characteristic ages and magnetic fields and so on, they imply a very, you know, a, a jump in those, in those values, which is clearly not, not physical. So there's clearly another mechanism at play here in terms of how pulsars spin down with time. So why do we need to find all the pulsars? Well, currently there are very, very small populations of the most interesting objects. So there's, you know, there's one double pulsar and there's a small number of binary neutron stars. So it's, it's unlikely that we can find examples in there where we can easily measure the things that we're interested in measuring. Um, we want to find sources like hierarchical triples, and I'll give you an example of that, to measure or to test general relativity and other relativistic binaries for the same purpose and for measuring um, uh, masses very well. And we want to find rotationally stable millisecond pulsars in order to conduct um, the experiments of um, the pulsar gravitational wave detectors, which I'll talk to you about very briefly um, now, actually. So when you talk, when you hear about pulsar SKA talks, you hear about the pulsar timing arrays, and these rely on having a, a, a group of very stable millisecond pulsars in the timing sense distributed around the sky, where you can measure correlated variations in their timing history as gravitational waves, very low frequency, nanohertz frequency gravitational waves cross. Um, the, these, the, these arms of this galactic scale gravitational wave de detector. So this relies on having a few tens of millisecond pulsars with extremely high uh, timing precision. And at the moment, the number of pulsars that we can do this with is, is limited to maybe five. So we, we, we need to increase the millisecond pulsar population by a factor of 10 in order to find the 50 that are needed for this experiment. And this experiment will, uh, probe the end spiral phase of supermassive black holes at the center of, of galaxies. Uh, I talked a bit about hierarchical triples, and this is, you know, the, the, the dual case of this, where you have a pulsar orbiting a white dwarf, a, a young hot white dwarf, and the two of them are being orbited by a cool old white dwarf. And in this system, you can actually um, uh, test uh, the equivalence principle in GR because you have a pulsar falling in the um, in the gravitational potential of a white dwarf and you have another white dwarf falling in the gravitational potential of the white dwarf. So you can test whether um, these two things behave in the same way. So the, the, the gravity doesn't depend on the, the, the form of the, of, of, the, of the concentration of mass. Um, and it's really interesting just to, to leave you with, you know, the the, um, the the high precision of, of pulsar measurements. This is really interesting how you derive these properties from these kinds of systems. You know, th these are the timing residuals from the radio pulsar in that system, assuming that it's stationary as a as a you know an isolated neutron star somewhere up in the galaxy with a given period, the period at which it was discovered. And of course, you see that the the residuals so. The model assumes that the period 
the observed period is constant. But of course, uh, the residual shows you that the, the, the sinusoidal residual shows you that the apparent period is changing in a sinusoidal way, as you would expect by a, you know, a pulsar orbiting a binary companion. Now, the, all, all of the data shown here in, in these little color uh, dots have error bars on them, so you can get an, an, um, an idea of how well these things are measured. If you look inside that zoomed region, you see those little dots, which are the measurements of the radio pulse times of arrival, uh, the, the residuals actually, and you see that the residuals actually um, fall on another sinusoidal curve with a much shorter period, which is the signature of the um, of the uh, second orbit of the of the orbit around its own companion. So once you derive all the Keplerian parameters of the of the triple system, the residuals of the timing uh, model drop down to uh, you know the the microsecond level, as you can see. So that that's how you can do um, this kind of um, uh, measurement and how you can then address things like the equivalence principle in uh, in GR. So what does what does you know the SK actually? Um, What's the stated, what are the stated goals of the, of the SKA science project uh, for pulsars? Well, we want to triple the current known pulsar population and in doing so find all these interesting systems, including the high relativistic systems that can be used to improve tests of gravity in the strong field regime by at least one order of magnitude. And we want to also find at least one pulsar black hole binary, um, which will um, allow really interesting GR tests and have some consequences on quantum gravity. Please don't ask me anything about that. Um, we want to detect gravitational waves, of course, and that, in, that involves um, increasing the number of millisecond pulsars to, um, by, by an order of magnitude such that we have these stable sources, timing sources uh, distributed around the sky for nanohertz um, frequency gravitational waves. And we want to improve the mass radius relation, so the equation of state for neutron stars, by more than an order of magnitude by finding these sources. And the SK is the, the optimal instrument to do this, and it all boils down to those four points. It has large instantaneous sensitivity. It has a large field of view, which can be covered with multiple beams or a large number of beams to search for and time multiple pulsars simultaneously. It has a large frequency bandwidth, so you can um, correctly or, or um, uh, you know, as well as possible account for frequency dependent effects and, and probe um, the astrophysics of the emission mechanism and the instellar medium. And it has accurate polarimetry, which gives you a lot of information about the details of the radio emission and the geometry of neutron stars. So that's all I have to say. And I hope, uh, I hope uh, this wasn't too technical. I know it's a lot of information, but I think it's, it's useful to have this uh, slightly more in-depth view of, of how um, pulsar astrophysics works these days and why we're interested in these uh, large instruments in the future. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Aris. So now the talk is open for questions. Uh, Teresa, who invited uh, Aris to give this talk, will manage it. So Teresa. Thank you. So, yeah, I just wanted to say, first of all, that we are so happy that we did invite you because uh, that was an absolutely excellent colloquium, uh, super Thank interesting you. and uh, very pedagogical. And, I, and my own research is very far from pulsar research, so I, I'm a good test group for this. And uh, it was pedagogical while not being too lightweight at the same time. And uh, it was clear that you enjoy talking about these topics. So <laughs> I really, I really enjoy that. Just wanted Thank to you. Discuss that. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions myself, but I'm going to see first. I see uh, there's already a few here. Ruben uh, Lopez Cotto, do you want to start up? Yeah, sure. So thank you very much, Harris, for the for the nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding the pulsar timing arrays that uh, you mentioned. So you said that there are only five millisecond pulsars that can be used there, but uh, from the from the paper from the nanograph col uh, collaboration, I think they used uh, several more, right? So maybe what is this discrepancy? Are they using uh, some uh, non uh, 
uh, optimal MSPs or something like that? Uh, I'm being I'm being a bit controversial, and you know I, I'm also aware of the fact that this is all recorded and so on. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, I'm just acting out of curiosity. Eh? Not, yeah, yeah, uh, no, 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 that, that's fine. That's fine. I think um, the 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 point is, if you want pulsars with uh, timing resid, this is this the metric by which um, a pulsar is being um, assessed as a good or bad timer for the pulsar timing array is the rms of the residual of the you know after you've got the timing model uh, you get some residuals compared to your data and the rms of these residuals so if you want these residual the rms of the residual to be on the um tens of nanoseconds um scale or 100 nanoseconds uh, which is the kind of thing that you really want for the um, measurements of the stochastic um, gravitational wave background. Uh, and for that, you also need multiple sources that you can cross correlate to get the, um, the signature of the gravitational wave, which affects pairs of lines of sight simultaneously, let's say. So for, for that, you need sub 100 nanosecond or yet yeah, thereabouts um timing residuals in rms and and if you look at the whichever pulsar timing array publications there are these days there are of order i'm going to say five again not to be too critical but of order five sources that achieve that of course what you do I mean, if you're if you're carrying out this program, you are timing millisecond pulses and trying to improve your, you know, your timing models to get the the lowest possible residuals for for any pulsar that you can. And there's a lot of effort going into minimizing these residuals with more clever techniques. For example, time and frequency variable pulse profiles that better, you know, match. As a template, match the uh, the the observed um, the observed profile itself. So there is work on reducing those timing residuals for all these pulsars. But at the moment, the number of millisecond pulsars that satisfy the criteria for this experiment is very small. Let's just say very small. And so um, the the surest way to guarantee success for this is to increase the known population by a factor of 10. There's nothing. But how, how, but, but how is this going to improve uh, by one order of magnitude uh, with uh, whenever SKA comes? Are, are we going to get the timing residuals better for, for already known pulsars that are already known MSPs that are out there? Or are you talking about new MSPs that uh, will be coming for which we will be able to measure better the timing residuals? I'm talking primarily about the, the second, but I hope that also to some extent the first. Okay. But you're, you are raising a very good point because, of course, there is a certain amount of time that needs to pass in order to have a timing baseline to detect uh, nanohertz gravitational wave. So if you find new sources which are very good timers, they will only become, you know, very uh, well. They will only become appropriate for this kind of experiment after forty years, right? But that's yeah. that's still that's still okay. That's not really a problem. It just it it just means that you know things things happen further down the line. But it still means it's possible. So both of these things I, I expect will happen. Increasing the population will mean that you find uh, more pulsars that are rotationally stable, which is really what you need, the, the most sort of conservative thing that you need. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any more questions here, or maybe I can take the chance to ask one of mine. Um, so, I was intrigued by uh, uh, earlier in your talk, you talked about how the pulsar shapes can change with time. And you said there was one particular one that you have data from the 70s onwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when, I, when I look at a galaxy, for instance, if I have data from the 70s, there is just very limited information I can get out of that. So I was kind of wondering um, 
how reliable and comparable are these old observations compared to the new ones? Um, it, it depends what you're looking for is the, is the answer. Um, right. It, it just happens that, you know, th th this is the source I was talking about. So this has data from 1989 onwards, but I have a plot. I was tempted to put it in, but we're about to submit this paper. And, you know, I thought I'll, I'll leave it for the next, the next opportunity. We have data from the 1970s from this pulsar. This pulsar happens to have such a big change that the, um, you know, the changes in the time resolution of the of the recording instruments or of the sensitivity and so on don't don't really, you know, they, they they're not sufficient to smear it out. You can see the 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 profile and the characteristics of the profile at this level all the way back to the earliest earliest dates. Um, okay. I think this is an atypical example because the changes here are, you know, of the order 100 sigma compared to current current um, estimates of, of some sort of uncertainty. But, uh, but I think, um, it, yeah, it's atypical in the sense that the older data are um, from, so the, 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 the telescopes we're using, you know, Parks, Effelsberg, these telescopes were all built in the 70s. So the, the, the sensitivity, in terms of collecting area has been there all the time. What has changed is the uh, the ability to record very data at a very fast rate. So we don't have the time resolution. Uh, the bandwidth of the original receivers and backends was also very limited compared to now. So we don't have the frequency coverage as well. So in general, I think your you know your your situation also applies that it's 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 difficult to use the, the very old data sets to infer something new right but but uh, in 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 very rare circumstances where the where the changes are very dramatic the old data sets are very very useful okay well, that's really cool uh, it's unusual that you can have such uh, uh, use of the data for that long time as you can in this case that's right, yeah. Uh, are there any more questions here? Otherwise, I might uh, ask another one, if you don't mind. <laughs> no, at all, no. So this is, you You were one of the co-chairs for the um, Pulsar Science Working Group, Science Working Group for the SPAO. So this question is kind of related to that. And mm -hmm. this is uh, something I've been wondering uh, a while. Um, I, I assume there may be some overlap between the Pulsar Science Working Group and the transients ones, um, at least in, in potential commensal use of data. And uh, so I was wondering if you could just talk, uh, like mention a little bit what uh, overlap and what differences there would be in, in particular for use of data. And this is maybe a very wide question, so you don't have to be exhaustive, but just a few examples, because uh, uh, I've been wondering a bit about yeah. why isn't this an enormous big group together, for instance. Then I yeah. realize as I'm listening to your talk that uh, Pulsars is maybe a little bit more um, specified <laughs> that would warrant to have its own group. Well, that's that's right. So. Yes, I, I noticed that in the in your original email, and I, I sort of thought about that a little bit. Uh, so, you know, the, the field of pulsars has been around for a long time, and we we know quite a lot of things about the, the astrophysics of pulsars, as I tried to, to highlight today. And so we know quite specifically what we are after in terms of what the telescope capabilities have to be uh, in order to find them, in order to use them properly to, to extract all, all the science. Um, in the case of the transients working group, it's it's phenomenology driven, right? It's not source driven. So they're interested in finding things that are variable on, on shortish timescales. And what that thing is, is not, not important. So, well, it's important, but it's not, it doesn't drive the program. And so, I think there's a few things to say that are a bit more concrete. So um, one of the things I, I work on is the is the pulsar backend for the SK, and the pulsar backend is the same backend as the one that detects fast radio bursts or fast radio transients. Um, and so there's no distinction there. That's the 
you know, that 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 will find things that are variable on short time scales in the same way that it finds single pulses from pulsars, etc. Um, the uh, transient science working group, I think, has and and the, and and science cases that are currently operating on telescopes like Meerkat and so on has done very well to to illustrate the synergy between timing and imaging. Right. And this is something that pulsar astronomy has traditionally not done, but I think it will do more of it in the future. So the, the transient science working group is, I would say, more focused on the imaging side of things and borrows techniques in the time domain from pulsar astronomy. So, th so that's kind of the, you know, that's the that's the, the quick summary. I'd also like to say that we're organizing a meeting this this summer um, in in Greece. In fact, <laughs> it happens um, with the title "Timing and Imaging of Compact Sources" with um, you know SK and SK Pathfinders, uh, which brings together these these communities, um, both in terms of the science and the methodologies. And you know, one thing to say that. You know, maybe a little bit provocative, a little bit controversial, is that a lot of the sources that the transients, you know, the transients people, the transients community find, I think, are um, going to be explained as emission of some sort from neutron stars, whether it's regular pulsars or or um, magnetars or some, some other some other form of a neutron star. So yes, there is a lot of overlap. A lot of overlap there, but I think there's a there's a distinction in the in the in the techniques mostly, and in the fact that there are, there are no um, very clearly defined questions like the ones that the pulsar community has. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I just realized uh, we are a little bit over time here, and apologies for hogging the time in questions. But I don't see any more questions. If so. If you have any, please pick up. And otherwise, we might linger a little bit online afterwards too, right, Rene? Yes, okay. Yes, we can uh, stop uh, the talk here, stop recording, and we can stay a bit if uh, Aris can stay there, of course. Sure. So thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. And I hope uh, everybody enjoys, enjoys this, uh, this colloquium. Thank you. Thank you.